lecture for week 10. And again, I'm very sorry about the delay in posting both the slides and the actual lectures. Um, I had a lot of stuff come up, uh, but hopefully this will be a good transition between animal systems and information flow, which we'll be talking about over the next few weeks. So more cellular processes like mitosis, meiosis, and genetics. Um, and so this chapter is about animal reproduction, uh, but it reflects on some things that we've talked about, like hormones, um, and it is also going to be more of an emphasis on human biology. Your textbook talks about a lot of other different animals and other ways of reproducing, and we're just going to focus strictly on human biology. I also rearranged the chapters or the sections of the chapter a little bit. So we'll start by talking about the first section on reproduction methods with focusing on what exactly we mean by biological sex and sex determination. We'll get into human reproductive anatomy, distinguishing between individuals who produce eggs and individuals who produce sperm. Um, 43.2 and 43.6 are both about fertilization. So I combine those two or sections together and we'll talk about early embryonic development, human pregnancy and birth, and then hormonal control of human reproduction. So in thinking about sex determination, I wanted to start by clarifying some terms. Uh, in biology, we talk about sex. We do not discuss gender. Um, and I see a lot of people on Facebook comment sections talking about what it, what biological sex means. And I wanted to take a moment to clarify some confusions and talk about how in the context of science and biology, uh, there are really not just two biological sexes. It's a lot more complicated, a lot messier than that. So when we're talking about biological sex, we might be talking about anatomy. So we could be talking about external genitalia, which uh, might sometimes what we consider match with internal reproductive organs. Um, and sometimes there's intersex conditions where it's not clearly externally uh, male genitalia or female genitalia. And really that's just uh, kind of the beginning of how we start to classify biological sex, because there's also chromosomes, which are packages of DNA inside all of our cells and, uh, well, most of our cells. Um, and a lot of the time when we have sex chromosomes, they might be XX and XY, uh, which you might've heard of before, um, which are associated with what are considered female and male traits respectively. But we're gonna look at a lot of exceptions to that in terms of chromosomal sex determination. And sometimes you might be XX or XY, and you might lack the receptors for androgens, such as testosterone. Um, so your hormones could have something different going on than your chromosomes. There is a condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome. I'm going to link a video by uh, an activist named Pigeon who um, has an intersex condition, uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome. So their body produces testosterone, but they don't have the receptors to receive testosterone. And if you think back to when we talked about the endocrine system and cell signaling more broadly, remember that you have to have a receptor that matches that signaling molecule in order to have any effects from it. So you can be uh, XY in terms of your chromosomes, you could be producing testosterone, um, but your external genitalia might not necessarily match up with that um, due to androgen sensitivity syndrome. So there's a lot of different things that can be happening in terms of biological sex. In this lecture, because we're focusing on reproduction, we're going to think about a situation in which being XX means that you produce eggs, that you have um, vulva and a uterus and ovaries and a fallopian tube, which we'll kind of unpack, and that you have a kind of classical model of hormones, which we'll also explore briefly. We're also gonna think about um, being XY, meaning that you're producing sperm, um, that you have a very specific set of reproductive organs, um, and that you're producing testosterone as your primary reproductive hormone. Um, what we're not gonna talk about is gender. So that is something that is not uh, explored in the 
context and scope of this biology course, although there are some biology courses where we might start to kind of address it in terms of um, like a neural basis, um, gender informs your behavior, your thought, your identity, pronouns. It's something that a lot of people are increasingly talking about in different contexts, um, but it's not what we're talking about in this class. So we're going to talk about biological sex, focusing on whether we're talking about anatomical, chromosomes, or hormones. I know that's kind of like a big spiel, and I know that a lot of people might be uncomfortable with it or maybe disagree with me. All I'm seeking to address here is the biological context and clarity of terms, so I hope that was helpful. Um, in terms of what we mean by chromosomal sex determination, uh, what chromosomes actually are are packages of DNA that are organized in very specific ways. We have 23 different types of chromosomes, and we have two of each, one set from our biological mother, one set from our biological father, and they look kind of like this. So you can see that um, the ones uh, that are the same chromosome number kind of match up in terms of their patterns and their size. So uh, for example, chromosome number seven, that first one on this picture, you get one from mom, one from dad. Uh, and so those sex chromosomes, which are X and Y, uh, have genes on them that are associated with secondary sex characteristics. So things like hair or breast tissue development. Um, and so we consider them sex chromosomes. The rest of them are what we call autosomal chromosomes. So these are examples of the X and Y chromosome. Uh, this is a little bit confusing because they visually in this picture look like an X and a Y. That's not always the case. It just depends on what stage of the cell cycle they're at. Um, but here you can see that there's a few genes that are marked specifically uh, SRY, which has to do with sex determination on the Y chromosome and sperm development. So the Y chromosome is generally associated with characteristics associated with being male. So the human sex chromosomes are X and Y. It's not always that case for all organisms. So I mentioned that there's a lot of different pairings of sex chromosomes, that it's not as simple as XX and XY. Usually if someone is XX, they're considered chromosomally female. If they're XY, they're considered chromosomally male. Um, but there's a lot of other conditions. So for example, XXY results in something called Klinefelter syndrome, where you have a lot of male characteristics, but also um, it's kind of like an intersex condition. There's a lot of other uh, like breast tissue development, reduced uh, penis size, things like that. Um, Turner syndrome is X null, and so that's where you only have an X chromosome and not a second X chromosome. So these individuals often appear what we consider female or um, characteristics associated with that, uh, but they often have reduced height, um, sometimes webbing around their neck. Um, there's sometimes developmental problems. XYY is called super male or XYY syndrome. Uh, for a while, it was thought that there was a disproportionate amount of people who were incarcerated that were XY, XYY. Uh, people thought that maybe it had to do with like anger issues, um, but I think that's been debunked. So that's another condition. And then triple X or trisomy X. Um, SOMI is referring to chromosomes and tri to having three, so trisomy X. Um, We'll talk about Down syndrome a little bit later, which is called trisomy 21. So a lot of these uh, where you have like an extra chromosome has to do with the formation of gametes, which is meiosis. We'll talk about that a little bit today and then over the next couple of weeks. Um, and so the formation of sperm and eggs are what ultimately might result in offspring having Klinefelters or Turners or super male or trisomy X. So again, it's not just XX and XY. There's a, this is just a small subset of other things that can happen with our sex chromosomes. And it's uh, not just XX and XY for all organisms. Birds have Z and W for their sex chromosomes. And uh, instead of it being the same for female and different for male, uh, for them, they're, they uh, have males being produced by having two Z chromosomes, um, and then female is Z and W.
And then reptiles do something completely different. Um, if they are in hotter environments in their eggs, they become female. If they're in colder environments in the egg, they become male. So the environmental cue, the temperature during a very specific uh, period of development within the egg is what ultimately determines whether they have testes or ovaries in their hormonal state. Um, there's actually a really interesting study that I just saw yesterday, I think, um, that talked about how be, right now with changing climate, um, many turtles are being born female, which uh, throws off their population balance and affects reproduction down the line. And it's not the same for all reptiles. So turtles might do one thing, alligators might do something else. So the temperature ranges that cause that switch are a little bit different uh, depending on the species of reptile. So when we're thinking about reproduction, we're thinking about kind of large scale reproduction of organisms. Um, but I also want you to get familiar with these terms that have to do with the reproduction of cells. So mitosis is acellular, re, or sorry, asexual cellular reproduction. So it's still making copies of cells, but it's asexual. There's no genetic recombination. You're producing two identical daughter cells that are completely identical to the original mother cell. So this happens in a lot of our tissue. Um, mitosis also happens in uh, certain types of single-celled eukaryotes. Um, in single-celled organ single organisms, it gets a little messy. Sometimes there's stuff like binary fission, uh, budding, different stuff like that. But for our cells, we're focusing on asexual cellular reproduction being associated with mitosis. Meiosis is how we get sexual reproduction. It's a reductive process, so we're producing four cells from one original cell, um, and these are called gametes. So there's genetic recombination, they're different from the mother cell. Meiosis is the process by which we produce eggs and sperm. So I want you to start thinking about it in that way. Um, mitosis and meiosis also happen at completely different points of our life cycle. So I'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be exploring mitosis and meiosis a little bit further. Uh, often in school, they're kind of grouped together and you might have learned them in the same lesson. You might have learned that meiosis is just mitosis twice. It's not. They are so different in terms of how uh, DNA organizes itself, in terms of how the cells divide um, in terms of where they're happening in the body. Um, so please make sure you separate these processes in your mind. So like I mentioned, um, mitosis and meiosis happen at different times. When we have fully formed adult organisms um, with testes and with ovaries, they are producing gametes. Um, and so um, People with testes produce gametes constantly. People with ovaries go through a period of meiosis before they're even born, and then it gets frozen. Um, and then they go through finalization of meiosis once a month on average, um, which is your menstrual cycle. Um, so that's the release of the egg. So sperm and egg are gametes that are produced through meiosis. Um, that's happening in very specific tissue in testes and ovaries in adults. If the sperm and the egg meet, um, that doesn't happen all the time. A lot of sperm dies without ever meeting an egg. A lot of eggs die without ever meeting sperm. But if they come together and it's exactly perfect, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong, but if they fuse together through fertilization, then you get a new offspring, a zygote, um, and that starts undergoing mitosis. So that's how we go from being one single cell uh, to having tons and tons of complex cells and tissues throughout our body is this process of mitosis. So I know there's a lot of terms here that you might not be familiar with yet. I'm just introducing them. They're not the focus of today's lecture. They do really support kind of contextualizing a lot of things though, and we are gonna explore them over the next few weeks. So gametes are, um, haploid, which means they only have one set of chromosomes, not two, like we were talking about with our body cells earlier. Um, these are also called sex cells or sexual reproductive cells, and for us that means egg or sperm. Um, this picture in the bottom right, uh, I'm going to go back to it 
later in the lecture, um, but it's so cool. It just so happened that this woman uh, was having surgery done and there was a camera um, that was filming right when something called a follicle released an egg through a process called ovulation. So she was getting surgery at the exact perfect part of her menstrual cycle um, and they captured the release of this egg on camera, which is just amazing. So the egg is an example of human gametes. Um, in plants, pollen is another example of a male gamete. So that pollen has sperm inside of it, which is what's pictured in the top right with that bee rubbing against the flower covered in pollen. So the sperm and egg are pictured together here, and you can see that there's a very clear size difference. So the egg is much, much bigger than sperm. Um, sometimes you can see eggs like with your naked eye, which is amazing. They're huge cells and sperm are super tiny. So you can see there's tons of sperm covering this egg, um, but ideally only one sperm is going to fertilize the egg. So we'll talk about processes in a little bit that make sure that takes place. Um, we'll start by talking about um, kind of how these are formed and getting into um, the anatomical structures that allow these to kind of emerge from the body. Another thing to note is that the egg is sometimes called an ovum, ova, or oocyte. Uh, basically, when you see those O words in uh, reproductive biology, it's referring to eggs. So that kind of ties me into my next point, which is on this kind of uh, repetition of terms and breaking them down. So when we're talking about this process of gametogenesis, um, that occurs through meiosis. So here, gametogenesis, which is the genesis or formation of gametes, gametogenesis, uh, is kind of used interchangeably with meiosis. Meiosis is a process through which we create haploid gametes. Gametogenesis is the creation of gametes. So those basically mean the same thing here. Um, spermatogenesis is the genesis or creation of sperm. Oogenesis is the creation or formation of eggs. Uh, so again, gametogenesis kind of captures spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Spermatogenesis just referring to sperm. Oogenesis just referring to eggs. And uh, these are kind of tricky because spermatogenesis basically happens all at once. Um, there's unique cell types that are involved, uh, but it's happening at a different rate than oogenesis. Um, the first part of oogenesis happens before an individual is even born. Um, so if you are pregnant and your baby is someone who produces eggs, um, she'll have a certain number of eggs in her body, but they're not technically fully formed and divided yet. Um, that happens after puberty begins, right before um, the eggs are released, kind of they um, mature one at a time and then are released on a monthly basis. So I'm gonna first talk about the reproductive system in people who produce sperm. Um, I showed an image similar to this when we were talking about the urinary system because the urethra, the tube that connects the bladder to outside of the body um, in people with sperm integrates with the reproductive system. So it goes through the penis. Um, there's also a lot of lymphatic tissue in this reproductive area as well. So a lot of systems come together. The structure of the scrotum is also really important for housing the testes and making sure they're at the correct temperature. Um, so when babies who have testes are born, they are still inside the body, but as they sexually mature, those testes drop more outside the body. There's muscular changes and connective tissue changes to make sure that those testes and the sperm are outside the body. The reason for that is that our body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius and sperm uh, does best, it, its optimal temperature is about 35 degrees Celsius. So keeping them outside the body ensures that they're kept at the right temperature and not damaged. So the way that those sperm are produced um, is in the testes, there's um, a lot of these uh, tubules and specific structures. Um, there's a lot of androgen or male hormone production. Um, so that's all happening within the testes. Um, the process of spermatogenesis is 
pretty complex. You don't need to worry about it for this class. It's more going to be covered in physiology. Um, but the production of one sperm cell takes about 64 days. So one sperm cell requires a lot of division and maturation, but that can happen uh, to 200 million sperm cells all at once. So every single day, about 200 million sperm cells are dividing and maturing and um, able to kind of go through their process. So it's a pretty consistent amount maintained at different points throughout the body. Um, and so that's about the same number of sperm cells as the amount in a single ejaculation. Um, so there is about one full uh, ejaculation per day at high reproductive capacity um, in kind of a normal situation. Um, the testes are also made up of a lot of connective tissue. They have this organization of lobules and seminiferous tubules, like I mentioned. Um, those are really important for spermatogenesis and for maturation, and we'll talk specifically about what structures are important for maturation in just a moment. Just a plug for common sense sexual education here, though. I don't want to lead to any miscon uh, misconceptions or confusions. Um, just because an ejaculation happens during the day doesn't mean all the sperm are gone. Uh, people can absolutely get pregnant from a second ejaculation during the course of the day. So just didn't want to have any accidental pregnancies as a result of that communication. Um, so here's an example of what sperm actually looks like. Um, there's the uh, cell body at the head of the sperm, uh, which is really just the nucleus. So it doesn't look like a traditional cell with a lot of cytosol and organelles floating around. The goal here is really just to get that genetic information to an egg. Um, it's protected by an acrosome and it has a lot of mitochondria. Uh, remember, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. They produce a ton of ATP, which is cell energy. And so they're able to power this um, flagellum that allows them to move through uh, the female reproductive system and reach the egg. So in order to do that, they leave the testes and they have to get to the urethra. So first they pass through the epididymis. Um, this is the first structure they pass through after leaving the testes, and it's very important for maturation. So it's a lot of smooth muscle, so kind of that peristaltic movement. Um, it allows them to kind of pass through over a long period of time and mature, um, and they are stored there for quite a while until ejaculation occurs um, after a specific point. They then pass through the ductus deferens, also called the vas deferens, which is another muscular tube um, that is basically kind of connecting the, um, the epididymis to the next set. So it's just kind of like a series of tubes. Um, the term vas deferens might be uh, really clinically important to you or might be familiar to you uh, because you might have heard of a vasectomy. So this is kind of a long-term contraceptive sterilization method. Um, it's where you physically separate the vas deferens uh, through different means. Um, there's kind of different techniques involved. There's a very low failure rate, uh, but it does happen. So there are people who, um, partners who are monogamous, like actually monogamous, and still end up with pregnancies after having a vasectomy. So it's not foolproof, but it's a very low failure rate. Um, so it's a pretty good relatively painless, long-term or permanent contraceptive. Um, the seminal vesicles are also important because they uh, provide the bulk of what is considered semen. Um, so semen is not just sperm by any means. There has to be a lot of material to supply and protect the sperm and make sure it gets to the egg. Um, so there's fructose, so different sugars, enzymes and proteins, mucus, alkaline material. That alkaline material is important because the vagina is extremely acidic, and so the sperm has to kind of uh, be protected from that pH condition. So alkaline and acidic together neutralize and protect the sperm. Um, there's vitamins, different signaling molecules. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in semen to protect the sperm. The prostate gland is also important because it contributes to that alkaline nature of semen. Um, it's also clinically important. Uh, prostates are important to get checked. Um, and there's a lot of cancer situations associated with prostates.
There's also what are called Cowper's glands or the bulbourethral glands. Um, so these are what produce what's called pre-ejaculation. Um, so it's a thick, salty fluid to kind of help cleanse out the urethra, provide lubrication. Um, and it can also uh, pick up sperm that are already in the urethra. So if there's an ejaculation and then later another sexual event that uh, those Cowper's glands can pick up sperm and transport it out. Um, so if you're using contraceptive methods like the um, pull-out method, uh, it is not going to be effective if there's already been an ejaculatory event earlier in the day uh, because of this Cowper's gland secretion. So in order for the sperm to actually get to the eggs without medical intervention, um, you rely on the influence of the circulatory system, so vasocongestion. Um, so this signaling with nitric oxide actually happens in a lot of different situations, in sexual arousal, but also in REM sleep, and many, many, many other factors. Um, so basically vasodilation occurs, increased blood flow and retention of blood, so not just flowing through, but staying in the gland's penis. Um, and so if we think about signaling molecules, there is a signaling molecule called phosphodiesterase that influences um, the cyclic AMP pathway, which I think I briefly mentioned when we talked about second messengers, um, and it also interferes with nitric oxide signaling. So it interrupts this whole process by which an erection occurs through vasocongestion. And the way that Viagra actually works is by inhibiting PDE5, which is a type of phosphodiesterase. So there's something that might stop nitric oxide signaling. Viagra basically makes sure that nitric oxide signaling works. And then there's the Leydig cells, which are in the testes. These are important to know about, and they're what actually produce testosterone. Um, remember that there's a lot of hormones coming from other parts of the body that form these bigger feedback loops. So it's not just hormones wildly being produced in gametic tissue um, or in uh, gonadal tissue. Um, it's regulated in the brain. So I realize this diagram might be a little bit confusing uh, since we were just talking about the male reproductive system. In the top right, that image is not a scrotum. It's the pituitary glands, anterior and posterior pituitary with the hypothalamus above it. So it's showing this big feedback loop between the brain and the testes. So I also showed an image similar to this when we were talking about the urinary system. Um, it's really important to recognize that the uh, reproductive system in people with eggs is very separate from urination. Um, we'll get back to that in just a moment. Uh, and it also has to accommodate fetal development. So there's many structural differences here as well. Um, it's primarily internal, whereas the reproductive system on people with sperm is primarily external um, and it produces mature eggs in an extended cycle, so kind of a monthly cycle, which I've mentioned. Even though it's primarily internal, there are many external structures, um, kind of broadly called the vulva, so that includes the clitoris. Um, so the glans clitoris is very similar and it's kind of analogous to the head of the penis in terms of sensory tissue and nerve endings. Um, so there's a lot of analogy there. And it's actually much bigger than people recognize. Um, so this kind of uh, large structure that's kind of going up and to the side um, is kind of the extent of the clitoris. There's the labia, um, which are shaped very differently for every single person, um, the kind of smaller ones on the inside, and the so labia minora and labia majora on the outside, and then you can also see the vaginal opening. Um, there may or may not be a hymen. Hymen are um, not really a full uh, kind of covering, and they also tear for any manner of reasons, um, using a tampon, riding a horse, engaging in strenuous exercise. Um, so there's a lot of people who put stock in having a hymen. There's a lot of cultures in which uh, it's checked prior to marriage. Um, and it's just not a reliable anatomical tool for 
anything. Um, and our bodies are just so different uh, that I really hope that you can, when you're thinking about yourselves and your families and talking to your patients, you can start to deconstruct shame around them. Um, there's a lot of people who don't know about kind of vaginal or vulvar, vulvar, vulvar autonomy or anatomy um, or autonomy, really. Um, so I'm hopeful that you can kind of take a look at this, see distinctions, remember what you learned in sex ed and what you didn't learn in sex ed, um, and kind of talk to your patients a little bit more openly about this. Um, hymen are not a reflection at all about sexual activity. And Sexual activity, um, especially consensual activity in which your body responds in certain ways, doesn't fundamentally or really at all change your anatomy. Um, so I just want to make that very clear. Um, that kind of ties into my next point, that the vagina is very muscular and self-cleaning. It can go through a lot and it can recover a lot. And so um, it, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens to your body in childbirth. It's totally valid to need time after you have given birth to recover and birth and sex don't define your body. So it, um, you know, expands a lot. It contracts a lot. It's self-cleaning. Um, so there's a lot of shame associated with kind of um, smells and uh, different um, secretions coming out of the vagina, but it's all totally normal. Um, there's a broad range of what's normal, um, so I hope you keep that in mind too. Um, but this is, uh, the vagina is a channel that is made of smooth muscle and a mucous membrane. Um, it secretes mucus, so it's self-lubricating and self-cleaning, um, and it also has its own really vibrant and unique set of microbial flora that help keep it healthy and at a very low pH. Um, so from a very early age, you get lactobacillus as part of your normal flora, and that's really important for the vaginal, vaginal normal flora as well. So uh, again, one more thing to note is that the vagina is separate from the urethra. A lot of people don't realize that. And so um, there's people who are confused by the fact that you can use a tampon and pee at the same time. That's stuff that's like basic stuff about your body that we are not always told uh, in comprehensive sex education. So hopefully you can talk to your patients about that and make sure that they know that, that they're aware of kind of these different orifices and openings in their body. So uh, when we're thinking about a lot of these reproductive processes, such as ovulation, the release of an egg, fertilization, and embryo development, all of that is happening much deeper than the vagina and past the cervix. So the cervix um, is a structure that uh, separates out the vagina and the uterus. Um, it's really important for sperm movement and for separating out those two areas and also for clinical screening. So it's a good site to take uh, cell samples and to make sure that um, you don't have different things like human papillomavirus or certain cancers. Um, getting into the uterus, uh, we have the myometrium, which is myo means muscle. Um, so this is a thick layer of muscle that surrounds the uterus. Um, that is what causes contractions and also cramps with different hormone signaling. There's also the endometrium, which is the inside layer of the uterus, and that has layers that shed during menstruation. It's also where a developing embryo might implant and grow and develop. So this gets, this gets tricky because sometimes endometrium grows where it's not supposed to. Um, there's an extremely painful condition called endometriosis that occurs when that endometrial tissue grows where it's not supposed to. Um, it can lead to excessively heavy bleeding during menstruation because you have so much extra stuff to shed um, and it can be very dangerous and lead to a lot of fertility issues. And it's another thing where uh, doctors don't listen to women and don't trust their pain and their reports of their pain levels. So it gets underreported and we haven't studied it as much as we should because doctors and scientists need to trust women more. <laughs>
So getting kind of further past the uterus and into the fallopian tubes, eggs are produced in the ovaries, which are those kind of round structures. And then the fallopian tubes, specifically the fimbriae of the fallopian tubes, um, form these kind of like hands that reach out and grab those ovaries. Um, so the fallopian tubes are also called uterine tubes or oviduct. Ova means egg and duct is tube. So all of this kind of means the same thing. Um, these are, the fallopian tubes are lined with cilia, which are those kind of long structures that extend out and kind of wave around, um, sort of similar to what we have in our respiratory system to keep out pathogens. When your estrogen spikes around the time of ovulation, that causes those cilia to start moving and beating, and it causes your smooth muscle to contract in the fallopian tubes, and so that pushes the egg out that's been released from the ovary. So the ovary releases the egg into the fallopian tubes, and then those cilia in the fallopian tubes and the contraction of the fallopian tubes moves that egg into the uterus. So fertilization actually occurs in the fallopian tubes, and then the zygote divides a few times, it grows and develops, and then implants in the uterus, where it stays until uh, birth. So I wanted to focus on that fimbriae really briefly. Um, this is definitely something you should know for the practical. You should be able to identify it on a model. Um, and this is what it looks like on a scanning electron microscope image. So just thought it was really beautiful and wanted to point it out. So when that egg is released from the ovary, it's actually released from something called a follicle. Um, so that follicle uh, is gonna be important for a phase of the menstrual cycle. One follicle at a time grows and matures and helps mature that egg. The follicle remains behind um, and becomes what's called a corpus luteum or gold body, and it's going to be really important for hormonal cues. So those eggs, those oocytes, mature in the ovaries. Um, you can see a histological slide of that here with an oocyte um, within a follicle. Um, and so there's different types of stem cells that are really important uh, for kind of growing, dividing, and differentiating. So these are called oogonia. They undergo the first part of meiosis during fetal development. Um, so when the individual with eggs is actually a fetus, so before they're even born. And then the second part of meiosis, the second part of um, gametogenesis um, and maturation of those egg cells happens every 28 days or so after puberty on a monthly cycle. So that's your period or menstruation. Um, is what you might kind of think of as that every 28 days in the middle point of that cycle is um, ovulation. So this image has a lot of information on it. I don't expect you to be able to see it, but if you open up the PDF and zoom in, you can uh, kind of see these different parts of the ovarian or menstrual cycle. Um, I just think it's really visually appealing and fun, and I just wanted to briefly walk us through the menstrual cycle. So we actually start timing it at menstruation. That's why uh, if you think you're pregnant or you go in for any sort of medical care, they ask you the date of your last menstrual cycle, the first day of your last menstrual cycle, because that's when we actually start the cycle. So this is the shedding of the uterine lining. Um, and then you get into what's called the follicular phase. So that follicle getting the egg ready. Um, there is a hormone from your brain that causes other hormones to be released from your brain and that signals follicles to grow and develop and get that egg ready. Then you have ovulation where the egg is released. Um, so one particular follicle matures all the way. Um, there's a positive feedback loop where you have like a lot of these processes happening at once and another hormone, LH specifically, surges. Um, I'll get back to that in a little bit. And then we have luteal phase. So remember that fo uh, follicle transitions to a corpus luteum, so that gold body that's going to be developing and secreting progesterone, which is called the pregnancy hormone. So progesterone is really important for the physical or physiological changes that happen that facilitate pregnancy. So at this point, you can either have pregnancy if the um, developing embryo implants in the uterus or you return to menstruation.
So this is generally the menstrual cycle. Um, I also wanted to briefly mention breasts because they're considered an accessory organ. Um, they are really important for uh, developing babies. Um, it, breastfeeding is also just so challenging. There's a lot of people who struggle with it, which is totally normal. Um, I don't think we talk enough, especially in a clinical setting, about how rough it is. Um, and so if you work in labor and delivery, please be kind to your patients. Please validate them and their challenges. Um, if they are in a situation where their baby is sick and they don't get to um, interact with them or have that skin to skin time or do breastfeeding as much as they would like to or they are sick, please make sure you're supportive and understanding and listen to what they would like to do. Um, really, babies need to get Fed, and there's many different ways they can get fed, um, but you should definitely have an ongoing conversation with your patients about what they would like to do and how you can help them accomplish it. Um, so I didn't want to include this without kind of applying a clinical setting, um, but I wanted to point out that the nipple is just a very small part of breast tissue and the dark part is the areola. Um, just because you have a big areola doesn't mean that you have large nipples. Uh, so that affects breastfeeding as well, but the areola is very important for infant vision. There's areolar glands that help provide lubrication during breastfeeding, and then uh, mammary glands as a whole that are secreting that milk are basically modified sweat glands. So you, um, the ductal system and this like all these sinuses and where the milk is produced is just visually amazing. Um, I just wanted you to appreciate that image really fast. So when fertilization does occur, when sperm makes it to an egg, um, that is internal. So some organisms undergo external fertilization, humans undergo internal fertilization, and it happens in the fallopian tube. And so here um, in this image on the left, you can see that fertilization is day zero. Um, by day one, you have what's called a zygote. That zygote starts to divide, becomes two cells, then four cells, then eight cells, then 16 cells, then 32 cells. Um, and it starts to kind of have these different layers of tissue as it starts to go into implantation. So from fertilization to implantation is just over a week. So again, fertilization occurs when sperm meets the egg. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna talk about the image on the right first because the GIF on the left already started. Um, so here you can see that the sperm, which has one set of DNA, is combining with the egg to make a new life form that has two sets of DNA. So let's watch this GIF on the left. Um, we see that the egg is surrounded by this kind of um, sticky mucousy material. Uh, why is it not restarting? Mm. It's a GIF, not a video, so it should restart. But basically what happened was we had the zona pellicula, which surrounds the egg. Um, it's kind of like this glycoprotein material, this sticky substance. Um, the sperm comes in and it uh, burrows through the zona pellicula into the egg. Um, when it burrows all the way through, we get what are called acrosome reactions, where that um, structure changes and it prevents other sperm from entering into the egg. After that, you have what's called a zygote, so it has two sets of DNA. You have mitosis starting again, so you have two cells or blastomeres and then four cells or blastomeres. So um, the acrosome is really important for preventing something called polyspermy or multiple sperm getting into the egg. So remember, um, you might have, uh, we talked about the chromosomes earlier, we talked about how we all have two sets of chromosomes. Um, and I'm sure most of us are familiar with at least one person in our lives who has Down syndrome. Um, this is a very common or relatively common condition, um, and it's absolutely compatible with a thriving life. So especially with modern medicine, we understand it a lot better and we can support people with Down syndrome a lot more. Um, many people with Down syndrome are self-sufficient, have jobs, have their own housing situation. Um, so this is kind of a situation where 
an extra chromosome is very much compatible with life. Um, so here you see on chromosome 21, one extra chromosome, that's trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. So this is one example where you can have an extra chromosome and have life, but uh, trisomy, there's other trisomies that exist. Some of them are much, much more debilitating than Down syndrome, um, and many are not at all compatible with life. So we know about Down syndrome because it results in someone who is alive and thriving, whereas many other conditions don't. Um, so if you had one whole set of chromosomes extra, that would be very, very bad. So those acrosome reactions are important because you cannot have polyspermy and result in a living zygote. Um, it's not compatible with life. So you have to stop other sperm from getting through the egg once one already has because you can't have another full set of chromosomes. So like I mentioned, we go through this period where we have a zygote, two cells and four cells and eight cells. Um, and so this is a very specific set of transitions um, and divisions. When we have what's called a um, blastula, that is where we have many, many cells that form a hollow ball that starts to fold in on each other or on itself um, through gastrulation, which forms a gastrula. And then we get very different tissue layers. So each of those tissue layers, the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm give rise to different tissues and organs and systems. So when we have implantation and we have pregnancy, a full term lasts about 266 days. Um, and uh, it doesn't have to last that long. Often if you have twins, um, it's scheduled to have, uh, you get scheduled for a much earlier cesarean section. And with modern medicine, we have increased rates of survival for babies that are born preterm as early as about 22 weeks. By about 28 weeks, um, full term is about 40 weeks, but by about 28 weeks, there's really, really high chances of survival if the baby arrives early. So just a couple things to note um, in terms of development. So remember gestation is divided into three trimesters. Um, so the first trimester is where you develop most of your major internal and external structures. Um, so you have full organ systems, limb buds, eyes, um, lots of different structures. Um, so these are not yet functioning on their own, especially the lungs and the liver, but they are starting to definitely be there. And after about eight weeks, it's called a fetus. So um, even that term is very specific for a point of development. In the second trimester, you have the full development of the placenta. Um, so that's playing a much bigger role. The fetus is growing in length. Your organs are developing further. Um, the fetus starts moving, which the parent may or may not be able to feel. Um, and so this placenta is so cool. It's an organ that is um, like a full big size organ in your body, um, but it's the DNA, the genetic material of the baby. So um, you have a full organ in your body where a lot of the genetic material inside of it isn't even from you, which is just amazing. And um, the placenta in the second trimester becomes responsible for nutrition, waste removal, and the production of hormones. Um, during delivery, the placenta also basically performs a blood transfusion. So when you have all those contractions, um, about 60% of the, or maybe about roughly half of the baby's blood is not in the baby. And so when you have contractions taking place, that forms a blood transfusion where the placenta pushes that blood into the baby, which is just amazing and wild. Also, after a baby is born, their stem cells uh, remain in the carrying parent's body for decades. So there's been um, studies where we, our global scientists have found these what are called microchimeric cells, so stem cells from a baby um, in a mother over 50 years after the baby was born. So these 
stem cells stick around in the body. Um, they're associated with healing. They've been found in scar tissue, and they even get passed on to younger siblings. So they're kind of a way of sticking around and healing you after your baby is born. Um, and then in the third trimester is when you get closer to um, labor and delivery, obviously. So the fetus is growing rapidly, organ development is continuing, um, and this is where the baby gets quite large. Um, so you are experiencing a lot of back and hip pain, pressure on the bladder, intestinal blockage, and severe circulatory problems, especially to your legs. Um, so clots might develop, and that's why it's important if you get a pedicure in the third trimester, um, don't let them massage your legs uh, because that can release the clots and then that can lead to heart attacks or strokes. Okay, so in terms of preventing pregnancy and being aware of ways in which we can accomplish that, um, when we say contraceptive, we mean methods of preventing pregnancy. Some of these prevent sexually transmitted infections, some of them don't, so it's important to distinguish between the, the two. Um, some forms of contraceptive are specific for people with sperm, some are specific for people with eggs. Uh, going back to the prevention of STIs, Condoms are really the most effective for preventing STIs, um, but that being said, uh, there's people who have latex allergies and use sheepskin condoms, and it's important to recognize that those do not protect against viruses like HIV, um, so keep that in mind too. Um, so different contraceptives include barrier methods where you're physically blocking the egg from getting to the sperm, like male and female condoms, um, or like the sponge. Um, there's also hormonal, so oral pills, the patch, the vaginal ring, injections, implantations, like the dermal implant, and also the intrauterine device, um, which can also be hormonal. There's family planning, um, withdrawal, and sterilization. So family planning is kind of like looking at your monthly cycle and figuring out the times in which you're least fertile. Um, there's also kind of those long-term anatomical methods. I mentioned the vasectomy. There's also a, the tubal ligation, which is uh, what we mean by getting your tubes tied. Um, so that's when you separate out the fallopian tubes in some way, either through banding, cauterize, cauterizing, or tying and cutting. Um, there's a much higher failure rate for tubal ligation, and they're also much more dangerous. Um, so it's fairly easy to get a vasectomy, and the failure rate is one in 2,000 compared to one in 200 for tubal ligation. The subdermal implant is becoming increasingly common, and I included a link to it. Um, the brand name is Implanon. Um, it's a hormonal contraceptive, so it's put under your skin in a fairly easy process, and it remains there for about four years. Um, the only thing is uh, if you're planning on having children pretty soon after that, or at least trying, um, it can take a while to leave your, symptom, uh, leave your um, body. Um, leave your system is what I was trying to say. Um, it changes your hormones to thicken mucus on the cervix and physically stop the sperm from getting to the egg, and it also stops eggs from leaving the ovaries. I also wanted to highlight the birth control shot for people with uteruses um, for one specific reason, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, so you might have heard of Depo-Provera. It prevents ovulation. It also thickened cervical mucus and limiting sperm motility. Um, so a lot of these work by stopping the egg from getting out and stopping the sperm from getting in by adjusting mucus. Um, it decreases your risk of certain cancers um, and also of pelvic inflammatory disease and pain, um, but it can cause irregular bleeding, weight gain, bone thinning, increased risk of some cancers and HIV, and it doesn't protect against sexually transmitted infections. It's 94% effective with a 6% failure rate. So there was actually a huge clinical trial where they developed a birth control shot for people with testes. Um, and so this was 96% effective in preventing pregnancy, which is a very high number, and it worked by just temporarily lowering sperm count. So all these people had to do was go in every eight weeks and get a shot, which uh, if you've had to take a birth control pill every single day isn't too bad.
Um, but during phase two of the trial, it was stopped because too many people were dropping out due to side effects, which included stuff like mood swings, severe depression, changes in libido and acne. Um, and people were also complaining about having to remember to take these shots. So uh, usually when I talk about this, I include a slide that has all the acceptable risk for um, birth control for people with uteruses. Um, it's insane. Stuff like sudden loss of vision, blood clots, deep vein thrombosis, um, migraines, bleeding out of the eyes, like all of this is stuff that happens to people who take birth control that's approved by the FDA. Um, so when we talk about clinical bias, this is what we mean, this idea that you know, yeah, no one should have to get severe acne and depression as a result of medication that they're taking to make conscious decisions about their body. Um, and there's a large swath of the population that does take medication that causes those things and much worse. Um, so that's why it's important to have people at different levels of research and decision making um, so that our interests can all be advocated for. Um, so uh, when we want to detect pregnancy, not prevent it, um, there is a hormone that's really important for this process, human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG, which is only produced by the placenta. So basically uh, it's produced by the placenta. The baby's kind of like, hey, I'm here, make sure that you protect me. Um, so it's helping to maintain uterine lining and reducing the response of the maternal immune system so your body doesn't attack the baby or the fetus um, and think it's something else. Um, so this HCG is usually only produced uh, if you have a placenta inside of you. Um, and so when you buy a pregnancy test kit, they have an antibody on them that detects HCG, the hormone. Um, so there's a lot of people with testes who uh, pee on the stick and think it's funny, but then maybe get a positive test result, and that's actually indicative of testicular cancer. Um, so HCG is sometimes produced in other situations as well. So if you uh, cannot get pregnant and you take a pregnancy test and you get a positive result, please make sure you go to the doctor. So we're gonna focus on hormones very briefly. Um, reproductive hormones get very complicated, but there's just a few take home messages I wanted to explain. Um, so first, this relationship between the brain and the reproductive system. By gonads, we mean testes and ovaries, um, but hormones in the brain and the adrenal glands and the gonads are all involved in regulating our reproductive systems. So you're going to hear a lot over future biology courses about GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This is a hormone that's released in the brain and causes the release of other hormones called gonadotropin. So gonadotropin releasing hormone causes the release of gonadotropins. Those gonadotropins include FSH and LH, which stand for follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone respectively. So FSH is really important for producing and maturing gametes. Luteinizing hormone is really important for starting ovulation, the release of the egg, and also the release of estrogens and androgens from the ovaries and testes respectively. Um, so I'm gonna show a couple of feedback loops. You don't need to know them. You just need to know that people with sperm have a very simple negative feedback loop that heavily involves testosterone. Uh, testosterone is actually produced in pretty much everyone. Um, it, it, the levels of testosterone change over the course of your life but it's a very important sex hormone for male reproductive systems. Um, and it's responsible for many secondary sex characteristics, um, including things like hair and muscle growth, and also spermatogenesis. People with eggs have very complex feedback loops um, that change over the course of their menstrual cycle. Um, they involve things like GnRH, FSH, LH, as well as progesterone, that pregnancy hormone, and estrogens like estradiol. Um, and then when menopause happens, it's not because you run out of eggs, um, it's because your ovaries are losing sensitivity to these hormones coming from your brain, FSH and LH. Um, and just to highlight a couple of physiological changes throughout the menstrual cycle, so we can see those 
fluctuating hormone levels during the follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. So you can see that estrogen and LH peaks um, at ovulation around day 14. Um, so when people are trying to conceive, they uh, often take um, kind of a fancier test kit for LH. And when you get an LH spike, that signals that you might be fertile pretty soon because of ovulation. Um, you can also measure your body temperature every morning um, and it actually spikes. Um, it goes higher around ovulation and remains higher during the luteal phase. Okay, so that's it. Um, the quiz is going to be open until Friday this week because I'm very delayed on posting this. I'm Again, very sorry about that, um, but hopefully this was helpful.